Our next major time period we're going to look at in the history of worship is the Baroque period. And I need to admit to you, uh, since you're hearing these lectures uh, from someone who happens to be an artist, that we primarily think of the Baroque period as an artistic movement. So, for example, if you've already had uh, reform to modern church history, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't remember talking about the Baroque period. And that would not be surprising. Uh, Baroque period might be mentioned uh, in, in a class on Reformation to Modern. It might be mentioned in a textbook for that same time frame. But it's not going to be emphasized as much. I do want to put some emphasis on the Baroque period. Uh, not just because I'm an artist, but because some of the elements of worship are indeed affected by this time period and are unique to this time period. And another reason I want to emphasize Baroque period is I actually do think spending a little bit of time with Baroque period will help us understand the unfolding of history in Europe. Remember, from the outset of these history lectures, what we've said is we want to look at the uh, major geopolitical progression uh, uh, over time in Europe. We want to look at the cultural milieu of Europe. And by looking at significant influences like Baroque period, it can help us understand what's going on in Europe and thus better understand the worship response. Another reason we would want to look at the Baroque period is I think the Baroque period helps us understand how we get from Renaissance to Enlightenment. Uh, even though there are trickles of enlightenment uh, in the late 17th century, we're really not into the enlightenment in earnest until the 18th century. So the Baroque period helps us understand a little better how we get from Renaissance to enlightenment. Now, the primary uh, hegemonic ideas that I want you to latch on to from this period of time are absolutism, and science. These are, these are the two big pillars, if you will, of the Baroque period. Um, let's, let's think about absolutism uh, first of all. Well, I encourage students when they think of absolutism in this time period to think of none other than Louis XIV. Uh, this is this grand monarch, the, the grandest of all the monarchs of Europe. We might even say for the entire history of monarchs in Europe. Uh, when, when you see uh, portraits of Louis, uh, it definitely looks overdone. And, and Louis was a shrewd politician. He knew how to use art. He knew how to use merrymaking to his own political ends. Um, it, you might be interested to know that, that Louis uh, was a celebrated dancer uh, during his growing up years. Uh, but he, as he got older and could see how politicians uh, had, had even manipulated his mother um, uh, during her reign, uh, he decided to use the banquet, uh, the, the feast, the, the ballet, which, which actually was like dinner theater. Uh, the, you know, the, there would have been uh, food, uh, but a storyline plays out in the midst of the party. He knew how to use these things as a distraction. He did them at such a high level that it would distract political leaders from what he was doing underneath the table politically. So absolutism uh, being this picture of pomp and circumstance, it's also the idea of a God-appointed ruler. The, the absolute ruler uh, believes that God has put him in this position to rule, that, that, that he wouldn't have uh, this power if God had not put him in that place. And you could just imagine with now the monarch of England, uh, who has become the head of the English church. Uh, the French are going to increasingly flex their muscles in terms of their influence in the church, that uh, even though absolutism is not a totally new idea, it sort of reaches a zenith during these years from 1600 uh, to 1750. Now, the other, the other idea uh, that, that is prominent during this time period is science. Uh, and, and I like to look at music technology as a quintessential example 
of science. Uh, now, I should say science is on the rise uh, even before 1600. Don't forget that Aristotle had been rediscovered by the West. So there are thinkers who are rising, uh, folks like uh, Sir Isaac Newton and Sir Francis Bacon, uh, who, who, are, who are rising up from these philosophical ideas and, and creating uh, significant scientific approaches to the world. Uh, but one interesting development of science, because science ends up influencing lots of things, is the way it, it impacted music. And at the very end of the Baroque period, uh, as we're getting closer to 1750, uh, there's a tuning system that's developed. Uh, and Bach doesn't, doesn't invent this tuning system, but he becomes aware of it. And he demonstrates by tuning a harpsichord to what's called equal temporal tuning that you could tune an instrument one time and go from any one key to any other key. The implications for this artistically are incredibly powerful. They are incredibly powerful. So uh, it, it's one of these neat moments in the history of music that relates to science and will actually have implications for even worship music uh, that's written later. So those are our just two uh, fun ways to, to remember absolutism and science in this period. Uh, the, the other thing that we see happening uh, in the Baroque period, uh, about halfway through, certainly by the time we get uh, to the 1700s, this is, the, the, this is a, a robust influence in Europe, is pietism. As we come out of the 30-year German War, uh, there's an increasing desire not to let go of orthodoxy, but to make faith more personal. Uh, some of this is out of desperation, just the, the great uh, tragedy of the Thirty Years' War caused people to be desperate for personal relationship with God. And, and Spencer helps lead this movement uh, uh, with small discipleship groups that he create, creates that, that that yearningly look toward a greater communion with Christ uh, and greater discipleship. Uh, we also see as we get into uh, the 1700s, uh, Count Zinzendorf, uh, who becomes aware of this movement uh, through his studies at University of Wittenberg. He also has relatives who are aware of the movement who introduce him to pietism. And he becomes a very important figure in pietism because he is a person of aristocracy. Um, and so uh, he sets up a portion of land that he's over in southern Germany uh, as, a, as a refuge for this movement. And this land that he sets up is connected to uh, some of the earliest reformers. So this is just one of these interesting connection points in history that emerges uh, seemingly out of nowhere. Uh, many would suggest this is absolutely divine intervention at this point in history. But you've got a group of early reformers called uh, the uh, Bohemian Brethren. And they are uh, what's in the modern day Czech Republic. Well, through a series of political events, they are having to leave uh, that part of the world. Well. Their part of the world is connected just underneath Germany and this land, some of which uh, Count Zinzendorf controls. And he sets up territory for them in this southern part of Germany uh, that is called Hernhut. And at Hernhut, it becomes a beautiful communion of saints. These people are protected. They enjoy this very heartfelt worship, and they begin to integrate very hearty song singing uh, as part of their worship. So there's a particular current of pietism, pietism that has to do with music uh, that emerges through Count Zinzendorf's leadership. He becomes a, a worship leader in a sense. But we have others who are associated with pietism who are also influential on songwriting. So for example, a very early thinker who sort of foreshadowed what would happen uh, with pietism was Paul Gerhardt. So Paul Gerhardt comes 
right at the beginning. His life ends just as pietism is beginning. But if you look at the quality of his hymn writing, it's, it's very personal. It has, it has many of the aspects of pietistic theology and writing. In a sense, he sort of foreshadows where pietistic writing is, is going to head. Um, I do have a hymn focus uh, for uh, this uh, particular point in history, particularly with the pietistic influence, and that is Praise to the Lord the Almighty, which you can find uh, in, in the last several Baptist hymnals. Uh, this is a hymn by Neander, who's part of the pietistic movement. Uh, and at first glance, this hymn might seem to represent more uh, orthodoxy. Which, which it does, which it does. Keep in mind the pietists are not against orthodox theology. Uh, but the opening lines of this hymn feel more like high church to me. Uh, praise to the Lord, the Almighty. <laughs> uh, it, you know, it's this high and holy view of God. But notice as you continue reading the words of this hymn, you might even look those up uh, on, on your phone as, as we're talking about this now, uh, that you have this powerful phrase that, that God shelters thee under his wings. So the more you look at this hymn, uh, and, and to be honest, this was surprising to me as I discovered this pietistic influence on uh, Praise to the Lord the Almighty, which uh, uh, actually uh, Eskew and McElrath uh, bring out the connection of that hymn to the pietistic movement uh, in their book, Sing with Understanding. Um, but as you look at these words, the more you look at them, you're going to say, yes, you have orthodoxy. You have a high and holy view of God. But you, there's also a tenderness uh, to these words. Now, I will suggest to you that this particular hymn works really well toward the beginning of a service. Uh, it, it certainly works well as a, as a song of transcendence. Uh, I, I have put it there more than once. But from a historical standpoint, I wanted you to at least be aware of, of that personal, tender, pietistic influence as well. Now the Enlightenment is our next major time period. The Enlightenment begins uh, in earnest in the 18th century. There's certainly rumblings before the 18th century, but it begins in earnest in the 18th century. Uh, and, and, and what we have uh, with the Enlightenment is science continually uh, continuing to awaken uh, and, and have influence on the average European mind. So how do we get science that was in the hands of really just a few uh, as we moved into Baroque period into the hands of the masses or into the hands of the rising middle class or as the French call it the uh, bourgeoisie? How does that happen? Well I would suggest to you it happens most powerfully through the encyclopedia. Now. Uh, the French didn't necessarily invent the concept, but they made it great. Uh, so the encyclopedia is intricately tied to the beginning of the Enlightenment, and the beginning of the Enlightenment is intricately tied to the French, uh, which is not surprisingly happening under the nose of these French monarchs. So here you have Louis XIV, the absolute monarch of all absolute monarchs. It's not surprising that under the noses of his, uh, 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 of, of those that follow him, uh, the, the royal line that comes from him, that under their noses you're going to see a questioning of his power, his absolute rule. This should not surprise us. In fact, uh, that's what is meant by the uh, inevitable uh, collision of science and absolutism from the previous period. Uh, Rousseau uh, is one of these figures who gets involved uh, with the French Enlightenment and becomes a prominent writer of the encyclopedia. Now, there, there's, there's a story with Rousseau that sort of captures his influence in this time period. Rousseau is aware uh, of an opera that is taking place. Now, now, I need to give you a little bit of context here on opera because this really, uh, what's happening with opera at this time period illustrates the movement from Baroque to Enlightenment. Uh, opera was actually invented 
at the beginning of the Baroque period. In, in fact, when you're studying Baroque, you often see the invention of opera as the beginning point of the Baroque period itself. Uh, but as opera uh, evolves between 1600 and 1700, because of absolutism, operas always cast the kings in a very, very positive light. They are not questioned. In fact, so much so that if a Greek tragedy is being portrayed, the storyline will be changed to make the, uh, the, the royal figure in the story look good no matter what. So, so they're, they're lessening the impact of these Greek tragedies just to make the king look good. Why is that? It's because of absolutism. Well, there's a counter movement that starts uh, in an area of Italy. Uh, it, the, the, the type of opera is called an intermezzi. We could practically just call it a comic opera. And what's happening with these operas is for the first time in the storyline of these operas, the aristocracy is being questioned. So, so there's a phrase uh, that I'm borrowing from one of my professors at University of Southern Mississippi uh, back during my master's days there, uh, Sanchez. Sanchez had this phrase that, that, that goes like this. Kings may play clowns, but clowns must never play kings. So a, a king can pretend to be uh, a fool if he wants to. A king can pretend to be a clown. No problem there. But if you're a clown, uh, you don't get to pretend to be the king. And, and this saying uh, did hold true for the way Baroque opera was done. You never questioned the authority of the king. What's happening with this comic opera, and the first one is credited to Pergolesi. It was presented in Naples, and it was called La Serva Padrona. So what's happening with this comic opera, La Serva Padrona, which means the mistress maid, is uh, a maid is pretending to be, in this day and time, don't, don't think of your modern context for mistress. Think of mistress as a person of aristocracy. That's what it meant at this time. The maid, the, uh, the clown, if you will, is pretending to be aristocracy. Well, you can't do that. You're, you're not supposed to do that. And so Rousseau hears about this opera. He goes and, and celebrates it through an encyclopedia article. He even tries to write comic opera. So this is a, a real turning point in history as absolutism is being questioned and enlightenment is one of the forces that questions absolutism and science as well is going to help overturn uh, absolute rule. Now one of the things I, I want to mention because really enlightenment is a philosophical movement uh, so it does actually overlap with Baroque period. So you have Bach who's writing in the midst of enlightenment, it, it is a full-fledged movement by the time he hits the scene. But, but artistically, we put him at the very end of the Baroque period, around 1750, and he is an absolute high point of reformed art. Um, th this, this is unquestioned uh, by, by art critics, and I, I just want to bring your attention to that. Um, for example, his work, uh, The St. Matthew Passion. Uh, is considered by some people like Albert Schweitzer uh, to be one of the greatest works of art in human history. In, in other words, if you compare it even to something like Notre Dame or other tremendous works of art, he puts it right there with these other works of art. And this comes out of the Reformed movement. I mean, this is a truly Reformed church artist, high point in all of human history. Uh, and, and I've suggested, this is just a thought that comes out of uh, some study I've done of Bach Cantata 106. Uh, what Bach does with Cantata 106, which, which is actually a funeral cantata, is just a tour de force of theology uh, meeting strong theology. Um, uh, the, the theology uh, meeting uh, powerful art. Um, so what Bach does uh, in, in this tremendous piece of art is he has uh, a, a theological statement that the person uh, who uh, lives on earth is going to die. 